Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the August Lunch to Learn, and a good afternoon to you. Um, our topic today is women, Civil War women forged the path. Women of the Civil War forged the path that others would follow. As they stepped out of their traditional and societal roles, they stepped out to make a difference and ended up making history. Our speaker is Kim Villalva. She is a leadership and historical trainer, author, and speaker. Uh, she's had extensive experience in education training and development, and a variety of clients, including corporate, nonprofit, the U.S. Army, uh, and uh, educational and traditional institutions at all different levels. She is an award-winning inspirational short story writer, and she has at least two books published by the Children's Historical Publishing, both of which are for sale today, Empowered and Women, Ohio Women in the Military, and Abraham Lincoln, a Servant Leader. She has designed several educational programs, including one for the Girl Scouts of America on the day in the life of a Civil War girl, and empowering girls for today and tomorrow. Um, she is a trustee of the American Veterans Heritage Center. Uh, she is also uh, holds a master's degree um, in uh, art from an organization communication from Southwest Texas State University and a bachelor's degree in communications from Kent State. She loves spending time with her family, performing cultural dances, and exploring the histories of small towns. What a great place to be, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Villalba. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, thank you to the Warren Historical Society. Thank you, Mr. Zimkus, for the kind invitation. Is everybody able to hear me okay? If I talk at this level? Okay, just trying to make sure that we're getting everything. Well, I am just delighted to be here. I did not realize until, um, until Mr. Zimkus was sharing with us over lunch that this was the old post office. And my husband was reminding me that several years ago, back when Thomas the Train was here, uh, we have two boys, they're now two big boys. We used to come every year to Lebanon, our clogging group danced in Lebanon, and we were here for one of the antique rummage sales and we just absolutely loved it. So we've always loved Lebanon and I'm just so delighted that we could be here today. So as John said, um, I'm a very active volunteer in the community, but you probably heard a lot of what I do tends to center around history, people, communication, training, trying to help people, and that is something that I've been so excited just to be able to find my passion and how those two things can connect. I'm very involved with the Auxiliary to Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. Some of you have probably noticed my pin. This is Clara Barton that we'll talk about in a little bit. We just returned from the National Encampment, which is their big national meeting up in New Hampshire. And I was just elected National Patriotic Instructor. So I thought, you know what, I have to find something else to tell the women's story. So I'm going to have this beautiful pin that I get to wear. As John did mention, I am the author of two books with Children's Historical Publishing, which is a nonprofit in uh, Dayton, Ohio, that serves the Miami Valley. And I'll talk about these books a little bit at the end. They're quick reads. So for those of you who say, hey, I just want something to get in and out, they're great. And for those of you who say, well, I'd like more information, there's lots of resources in the back as well. So I'll be happy to share those with you. So I'm also a very proud mom of a senior and a sophomore. So we are talking at our table. Um, any of you have kids or grandkids? First day of school this week, next week? Okay, it's gonna be hard, right? <laughs> First day of school back. So let's find out a little bit more about our audience. Any, um, who loves history? Who's our history lovers? Okay, good part of us, all right. Um, women's history, women's history lovers? Okay, uh, Civil War history? All right, I'm seeing a lot of the same hands, good. Any of you with Civil War ancestry? That you have an ancestor that you know of? Okay, a couple of you. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, how about veterans in the audience? Any veterans? Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, that helps me to get to know a little bit about my audience, because you've already heard about me, and I don't get a bio of you, so that does help. Thank you. So I've obviously had a passion for history, and especially the Civil War. I won't lie, I will say Lincoln has always been my favorite president ever since I was a kid, and even George Washington was a close second. This is actually an ancestor of mine. I can't think of a better picture. Uh, 
We uh, performed, I'm with a, a clogging group, and we were just at the Celtic, the Dayton Celtic Festival about two weeks ago, and we spoke about the Irish influence on Appalachian culture and clogging. So I was delighted to be able to show this picture. It, it definitely looks like a holler out there in West Virginia, which is where my family came from, part of my family. And this gentleman, um, Elliot Beer, was a Civil War veteran. So I'm delighted to be able to tell these stories and to dive into history. So as John said, one of my passions is working with veterans and working with history and telling their stories, because I believe all around us are stories. Stories of people who are just like us, who have to get up every day, who have to turn on the news, who have to see all the strife and the challenges out there in the world and in their communities, but they found a way to get through it. And so when I'm really down or when I'm trying to help our children get through some things, I find that it's so helpful to look at history, people who've gone before us. What have they done? What can we learn from that? So I'm going to tell you a quick story. A husband and wife were just finished placing their fast food order. Anybody like fast food? Yeah, my family eats way too much. So the wife had asked the cashier, do you offer a military discount? And the cashier smiled broadly and says, well, yes, we do. And he turned to the husband and says, thank you for your service, sir. Could I please see your ID for the discount? Well, the husband grinned and shook his head. And he says, you've got the wrong person. And the wife smiled as the cashier looked shocked. And she's pulled out her military ID and says, I believe you needed to see my ID for the discount. So this story was actually told to me by a female veteran uh, that I had worked with in some volunteer work. And it was a reminder of how common it is that we still don't see history. We don't see even today all of our veterans and everyone who has impacted history. So we typically say, well, since the beginning of our country, right, since the birth of our country, it has been men who have been serving. And that is 100% true. But there is more to the story than that, because women made history as well. Now, maybe they didn't set out to make history, but they set out to make a difference, and they did. I love this quote by Frank Moore in the book, Women of War. The story of war will never be fully or fairly written if the achievements of women in it are untold. So it leaves that story untold if we don't include all of the pieces. And continuing even more in the current day, Stephanie McCurry, uh, in her book, Women's War, Fighting and Surviving the American Civil War, repeatedly stressed that women are never just a witness to war. If we think of the history of war as the history of human beings in war, then we need the version with the women still in it. Women didn't just watch from the sidelines as everything was happening at the time of the Civil War. They were very active participants. So why would we not tell their story? And that's why I'm here today. I started this research several years ago. Uh, it was blended into the book that um, I mentioned at the top of my presentation, and I'll talk about a little bit. So there are so many tremendously powerful stories that we find in the Civil War, and those women's stories are just a huge, huge part of that. Now, I have to just let you know right up front that my stories will be focusing on northern women, women from the Union. That's not to say that women did not step up and serve in the South as well. They did. There are some very powerful stories for them. But because we only have so much time today, I have to kind of pick a little bit of focus, and so I focus on the North and the Union. Obviously, I cannot include everybody. So some of these names you may hear and say, oh, I've heard of her. But then, oh, I had not heard of her. So I hope you do find some inspiring, some inspiring stories. And maybe you want to take some of this further and look, um, look after yourself and find some new information. So let's go back. Let's kind of go back just right before the, the uh, Civil War to the Revolutionary War. This was the first time in our country's history that women had the opportunity to really step up and to do something outside of what society expected. So what, any guesses of what was normal for women at the time? And it pretty much continued into the Civil War. What was normal? What was to be expected of a woman? Take care of those kids, right. <laughs> Follow behind, clean, cook, right? Darn socks, do all that kind of stuff, right? Those were what was expected for women, those types of things. 
But Revolutionary War women at the time found a need that they could step up and fill. And there was something called camp followers. So that idea continued into the Civil War. But basically, soldiers' wives, their, um, their daughters in some cases, followed them to the battle. They stayed behind. They took care of the laundry. They cooked. Uh, they wrote letters. They were there kind of for morale to boost the soldiers. Some of their work actually did start with nursing. But it, again, it's, that's too sensitive for women, right? And women should not see a battered, bloodied body, let alone a male without clothing. So nursing was still largely for the men. But what they found was, hey, you know what? This could free up the men to get out and fight. So the women of the Revolutionary War actually laid the foundation for the women of the Civil War who would come just 80 years after. And with the Civil War on its heels of the Revolutionary War, it was the most costly conflict on record in American history. There were 600,000 military deaths. So the country was not prepared for this cost. If you go back and look at some of the early stories of battles, people would actually take their picnic baskets and sit up on a ledge and, hey, what's going on today? Kind of like we might gather for a Super Bowl party. Who's going to win? Um, in fact, <laughs> my husband and I were just at a Civil War event up in Hale Farm by Cleveland, and they did a reenactment of a battle from Gettysburg. So granted, it's a reenactment, but there are some folks, very nice people um, to the right of me, and there was a, um, a younger woman who kept saying, OK, who are we cheering for? Who do we want to win? And I thought, oh, <laughs> OK, um, yes, but no. You know, So it's the same kind of idea from back then. But they didn't realize that we would be in this war for four long years and the extreme cost of that. So the fathers and the sons and the husbands and the brothers were all away fighting. The women were left behind. So they had to step out. They had to do something. But what it was, it started with their desire to help. So what we find is that I believe one number that has been thrown out was about 20,000 women in a very, very broad capacity who did everything from growing crops to being part of the nursing to sewing to laundering uniforms to working in the sanitary commissions. There were a substantial number of women who wanted to help and alleviate the suffering of the men and that the country was going through. So the Civil War provided these opportunities right there for them. And so the women had an opportunity to show that their, their value in this way. They could step out and carve a path for others to follow. But I would argue that it was more than just carving a path for future generations. They were actually forging a path, forging ahead, because there were so many challenges for them. And they were actually pushing and per persevering for women that were to come. So when we look at women's diaries, and that's where a lot of my research has come from, women's diaries, letters, and journals, you start to get a feel for what the women were like. And there were six characteristics that really jumped out. Let's see, try this hand. There we go. That really jumped out at me as I did this research. How did they forge a path? What was it that they did? They forged a path through courage, through taking risks and sacrifices, through creative problem solving, which is kind of an overarching type of characteristic, through sheer perseverance, having to go through things over and over, through being trailblazers and firsts, and through continuing that dedication after the war. They didn't just stop and say, oh, well, the war's done. Time to go back and darn some more socks. They really cared, and they kept with that. So we're going to talk about some women today, and I hope you do find some stories that that inspire you as we look at this. So history loves stories of courage. Uh, courage is, is, is a great place to start, because actually, just to even step out of our traditional roles, you know, back then, would you see a woman coming up here and, and speaking and doing this that we do? Um, more than likely not. You know, they had, to, they had to step out with courage. And for somebody who started off very shy back in, when I was a kid, to if I look back at my life now and could look ahead, I would have never seen myself doing what I'm doing. But it took courage for me to get here, as it did for so many of us women. So women had to show courage, especially in the nursing field. And if you go back to what we were talking about with the, the Revolutionary War, women had already started popping up, showing that they could do this. And what they saw, what the, the men and the, the leaders at the time saw was, hey, 
we need men. And the Civil War was such a high, high, cont uh, high cost that they needed as many men as possible out on the battlefield. Well, it kind of worked a little bit in the Revolutionary War. Why don't we try it again? So it freed up more men to fight in battles, and so women were needed. About 3,000 women were listed as serving in the uh, Union Army during the war. Now, not all of them have detailed their service, uh, but when we do find their, their diaries and their stories, it is gold to be able to see what it was that they actually went through. But at the beginning, in 1861, when the war first started, there was no organized system. There was no medical training. There were no uh, certifications of degrees, nothing that was organized. No schools or nursing tr uh, credentials could be given to someone. In fact, if I was uh, following my husband off to war, I could be given the title nurse just because I'm there helping and doing what comes natural, quote unquote, stereotypically for women. They were used to this kind of work, right, in the home. They were already doing what was natural, so that's how people saw them. But once the Battle of Bull Run happened in July, and that was a very costly battle, Congress knew that they had to do something. So they officially approved using women in hospitals. And uh, at the time, two and a half Union soldiers would die of disease for every one who was killed in battle. So the needs for nursing was just tremendous. And they just were not prepared. So nurses had the courage to step up. First one we're going to take a look at is Marianne Bickerdike, also known as Mother Bickerdike. You may have heard of her. Well, Major General John Blackjack Logan one night saw a lone figure with a lantern crossing back and forth the battlefield where the battle had occurred later. And he thought, who is out there at this time of night? This is not safe. And he sent an orderly to get this person. The orderly brought back to his tent Mother Bickerdike. And he said, what are you doing? And she says, I want to make sure there is no living man still out on the battlefield. I cannot rest if there are still wounded out there. So even at night, she was out there trying to care for the soldiers. And her belief was very much that bodies need to be cleaned, that people needed to be fed and in sanitary conditions to help prevent disease from spreading. She was very resourceful and very feisty. She did a lot with various hospitals, but with her courage came that extreme feistiness. Um, she was looking at a hospital and talking with a surgeon. She was arguing with him and she said, I shall stay doctor and you will have to make up your mind because he had threatened to send her home to get along with me the best you can. It's no use for you to tie, try to tie me up with your red tape. There's too much to be done here for anybody to stop that. And doctor, I guess you hadn't better get into a row with me for whenever anybody does, one of us two always goes to the wall and taint never been me. So she was not to be trifled with. In fact, General Sherman said that she was the only person who outranked him. And if anybody had a problem with her, they needed to take it up with President Lincoln because she fought so hard for what she believed in. That took a lot of courage as a woman to, to go out there and say what, what she felt like she needed to say. Clara Barton that I have on my pin, she's one a lot of us know of that was dubbed the angel of the battlefield. She had been working in the United States Patent Office when the war started. And after the Battle of Bull Run that July of 1861, a lot of the wounded were brought into DC. So she wanted to do her part to get out and to help take care of them. Well, what happens if you walk away from your job to do something else, right? Do our supervisors always like that? No. So she got a strong reprimand and eventually was terminated because she was out there taking care of the men instead of doing her job. She then realized this was her passion and her calling, and she said, I, we've got to find supplies. That's what I see are missing. So here's where we start to see these threads again of creative problem solving that the women of the time used. She contacted her friends, she contacted her family, had everybody possible find ways to gather supplies. They were writing letters to the newspaper. What can we do to bring supplies in to get this network so they could get all the items to the Union soldiers? But I think she surprised people the most was that she didn't just sit back and you know, amass everything in a corner of a tent somewhere. She loaded up her wagon and took it straight out onto the field. And hence, we have that angel of the battlefield uh, title for her. 
General Surgeon General William A. Hammond approved her request. She even got a special military pass that allowed her to do that. So she was the very first woman to be able to go out onto the battlefields and take care of the soldiers that she did. So by this point, we have some organizations starting to happen because more women are stepping up. So Dorothea Dix was a nurse and an activist, and she was actually appointed superintendent of female nurses of the army by Lincoln's Secretary of War. Now this was not a military appointment, because unfortunately at this point, women still were not allowed to serve in the, the military, but it was an appointment, it was a way to organize and have some supervision. Well, Dix's, I, I love Dix's story because she pushed for very, very high standards. Women had to be plain looking, no hoops. They, she wanted them to be older and more matronly. She wanted them to be focused on their work. Again, to kind of, as women were stepping out of their roles, they didn't want anything else to hold them back. Oh, you're too soft, you're too pretty, look at you in your hoops flouncing around. So she wanted to step up and she was very, very strict with what she did this. Uh, my husband and I were actually at Fort Monroe several years ago and so I love the fact that, that she continued after the war to raise funds for a monument to the soldiers from that area. And she did not see a difference between Union and Confederate soldiers. She, was make, she made sure to treat both. Harriet Patience Dame, she looks pretty nice in this picture. Imagine her about six months uh, at least, no change of clothes, sleeping out in the open, probably very minimal bathing. She looked a little rough. There were some stories of, of uh, generals and, and so forth when they saw her, they were just, oh my gosh, this woman needs a bath. Um, Harriet Patience Dame was an amazing, dedicated woman who s worked with the 2nd Regiment New Hampshire Volunteers, and it was their entire service in the war that she served. Just like a lot of women, she did not have experience, she didn't have any kind of formal training, but she attached herself to them because she wanted to care for them. She called them her boys, and so anytime, wherever they went, she was right there with them. And that included going out onto the battle while the battle was a lot of times happening. Well, you can imagine the type of controversy that this caused. So Dorothea Dix that we just talked about, right? She felt that women who were doing the nursing needed to be back at the hospitals. They should not be out there doing this. So she tried to stop Dame. Dame says, nope, not listening to you. And even the New Hampshire governor at the time also tried to stop her and say, you are not allowed to do this. It's no place for a woman. Well, she didn't listen to him either. So people finally figured out, okay, she's going to do what she wants. So she faced everything. She, uh, her tent one time when she was cooking for the men, there was a shell that came in right where she was, where she was cooking, on, um, cooking some soup. She had faced starvation, unsanitary conditions. She helped bury the poor, um, the deceased. She did everything that they did, and she had one haversack that she walked along with the men and marched and carried everything that she needed to do. The commander of the 2nd New Hampshire Regiment said, Miss Dame was the bravest woman I ever knew. I have seen her face a battery without flinching while a man took refuge behind her to avoid the flying fragments of bursting shells. Of all the men and women who volunteered to serve their country during this late war, no one is more deserving of reward than Harriet P. Dame. So she obviously caught the eye of several. Well, one of the acts of heroism that just, just, just really stands out as courageous, one, one day the uh, regiment was pulling back, and they were pulling back to the James River. Well, unfortunately, all of the injured men who were in the hospital were told, if you can't walk, you're staying behind. And that was very, very hard, obviously, for the men to hear. It was a sort of death warrant, because at, by this point, stories of the rebel prison camps were, were rampant, and everyone knew that if you got sent there, it was death. So they didn't even know if they'd make it. Would they be killed in their cots where they laid? So Harriet Dame said, I will stay with you. I can't just go. I'm going to stay with you. But at the very last moment, under sheer desperation and more than likely just will to live, the men got up out of their cots and they, they hobbled along behind the regiment trying to make their way to where the regiment was. So Dame was with them and all she had was her coffee boiler and her coffee. 
She had a pair of boots on her feet. She had a tattered old mosquito netting over her head. Uh, her clothes were worn, everything else she had left behind. And any time they stopped, she made coffee. She cheered them and cheered them on. Sadly, they did lose one man of the squad before reaching Harrison's Landing. But because of her devotion and her courage to cheer these men on, they made it. Now, you'd like to think that once they got there, they would be welcomed with open arms, right? No, because there wasn't a lot of room. There is no room on the wagons, no room here to take these wounded men. So she went up and she fought the captain, who was the division quartermaster, and said, you will find a room. I don't care if it's a corner of a back of a wagon, you are going to put these men on there. So she saw her mission all the way through with great courage. I love this quote. This was after the war. Colonel Jack Adams said, to no class of people are the soldiers of the late war more indebted to the army nurses. How the eyes of the old veteran fill with tears when at our campfires, some old lady is introduced and the presiding officer says, boys, she was an army nurse. For a moment, the distinguished officers present are forgotten and instead they gather around the dear old lady eager to grasp her hand and say some kind and loving word and appreciation of her services. So how do you know if you've ever made a difference? Ask people around you and that'll be one of the surest ways that you'll know. So we have all these women who are serving as nurses who've stepped up informally to do this, even though they're not officially appointed by the army. And we now see that women are making a difference with courage. They, we've also seen that training programs for nursing down the road are worth looking into. And so the country has made a note of that because of their courage. But not all women wanted to serve in that way. Some wanted to do something more. And it was illegal to serve in the military, but that's what they yearned to do. For patriotism, they wanted to give back. Maybe they wanted a sense of adventure. They wanted to do something different because they cared. But they could not serve, at least as women. They could serve as soldiers, as They could serve as men. So the number, exact number of how many women served as soldiers disguised as men is unknown. Early numbers reported around 700, but the, the more recent research in the last couple of years is citing around 1,000 thousand women that snuck in and disguised themselves to serve as men. Now, what I always tell people when I talk about this is the number is not what's important. The number is not, we should say, oh, well, there's only 1,000 out of how many? That, you know, that's not what's most important. What's most important for us to remember and take away is that they did serve. Those women cared enough because their actions were, were revolutionary at the time. For a woman to not only do this, but to disguise herself, to kind of change her identity and to contribute in the same way as men is what is powerful. And women were... There, they deserve to be recognized because they were not supposed to be there. They were not supposed to be out on the battlefields, and yet they were. Women who served went through as soldiers, as men, went through all of the same hardships as men. And I would even argue probably more, right? You think about things like, well, how did they go to the bathroom? Or how did they do a lot of these things that, that men did? And just trying to conceal who you are has to probably be very, very difficult, especially in times of duress. Women were right there on the battle battle lines, just like men. They were in all of the battles, Gettysburg and Antietam. And this quote, I think, is very powerful. There was, after the um, Battle of Antietam, uh, Private Mark Nickerson of the 10th Massachusetts Infantry found a Southern woman killed, and she had been in disguise. And he said there was a dead Confederate up in the cornfield whom he had reason to believe was a woman. He wanted to know if she should be buried with the others or kept separate. And the decision was made to bury her separately. And many soldiers gazed upon her upturned face. The, uh, Private Dickerson said, I wanted to know her history and why she was there. So even at the time as this was actually happening, there's unknown history, unknown people, who, unknown women whose stories were unknown. And yet they paid the ultimate price just like the men did for their devotion to our country and cause. Several women died and took their stories with them. They died on the battlefield. We do not know their names. We do not know anything about them. And they took that story with them. Others lived long enough to tell their story. 
Some who did not fall on the battlefield and who were never found out, never told their, their identity. They never revealed that. Now, this next woman is, she's, there's so much you can look up with her if you're interested, Sarah Emma Edmonds. She was alias Frank Thompson of the 2nd Michigan in Infantry. She has her own story as a soldier, as a man. She was disguised as a man, but she was also a spy. But the way I'm going to talk about her today is how she found, um, found another woman who was like her. Because it shows this, this great courage and this risk that women took. So after the Battle of Antietam, similar battle we were just talking about, she was out there uh, looking for wounded, like with all the other soldiers walking around. And she spotted a soldier lying on the ground that she could tell. You know, we women can maybe have a sixth sense or whatever, right? She could tell that this was a woman, not a man. And so she waited till, till the other male soldiers walked away. And she came back to this soldier who was dying. And confessed that she was a woman, and, and so they had that sharing right there. So the dying woman went on to tell her story to Sarah, saying she had enlisted with her brother. They had been orphans. She had witnessed his death earlier that day, just about an hour before she herself was wounded. She told Sarah that she had fulfilled the duties of a soldier faithfully and that she was willing to die for the Union. She asked Sarah to bury her so that no one would ever know her secret, that she was a woman. And so Sarah stayed with the woman until she died and then honored her final request, and she buried her by herself beneath a tree. So, so many women, I think, like this, this woman who, who gave her life but did not want her identity to be revealed, took their stories with them. They kept their gender a secret. And to this day, we will never know all of those stories. Now, some women, like I said, were wounded. And you can imagine, they were found out. Mary Ellen Wise was another woman who served as a soldier, as a man. She was wounded twice, and she escaped being discovered. But when she got her third wound, it was very, very severe. Her secret, secret was betrayed. So she was dismissed. And later, uh, after the war, she was trying to get her back pay. Um, actually, it wasn't after the war, but after she was out. Well, she even got the attention of President Lincoln because, again, women were not supposed to be serving. They were not supposed to be getting pay. And Lincoln was very angry. And so he ordered that she be paid immediately. So for some women, they were able to get that back pay, but a lot did not. So you may say, well, what happens when women like her you know, were found out? Were they all dismissed? Most were. A lot of them, if they were wounded or they were found out, they were discharged. They, the officers thought, let's get rid of these females. We don't need them here. What happened, though, is a lot of women says, eh, I'm going to go find another unit to serve with. So they changed their name. They went to a different area because you could not stop them. Courage, risk-taking, creative problem-solving, perseverance. These women knew that they wanted to serve. So they were going to do it however they could, however they could face it. So it was just a setback. OK, got to go find somewhere else. Sometimes the officers found out, and they said, all right, well, we appreciate your service, but we really need you in the hospital. So they, they definitely tried to move her in that way and uh, make sure that they could still benefit from her. Women who were spies, like Sarah Emma Edmonds was, and others, they faced a lot of danger and risk if they were captured. Because not only were they a spy, but now they were also a woman. So this, this next woman that we talk about, this is the same person. And if you think, doesn't that look like President Lincoln? Yes, I think it does <laughs> on the, uh, the far left. This is Frances Claylin Clayton, who in uniform was Jack Williams. And there she is in woman's clothing. She was an amazing uh, soldier, again, who disguised um, who disguised herself and broke out of, of, um, of character and, and what people expected of her. She was never found out while she was actively serving. But after her husband was, um, was wounded, that's when she came out and said who she was. Her husband was actually killed. So these women who've stepped out, we've seen stories of courage with nursing. We've seen stories of courage with women who changed themselves, essentially changed their identity to become soldiers. And I forgot to mention, in case you're wondering, how did women do that, right? How did they, how were they able to disguise themselves? Wouldn't they be found out? At this time in the Civil War, there were no physical exams. 
as long as you could see and shoot a rifle, pretty much you were accepted. So there were no other types of exams where they would look at you beneath your clothing. There were a lot of young men at the time, young, young boys, and uniforms fit all sorts of funky ways. So if you were wearing something baggy, baggy trousers to conceal yourself, that was not uncommon. And you might say, what about bathrooms, right? What about going to the bathroom? Well, again, a lot of soldiers were very private. And so if they just went off by themselves to do their personal business, it would not be uncommon for a woman to be able to escape it that way. So just in case you had those questions rolling around in your mind. So going on and talking more about these risks and these sacrifices, spies. I just mentioned Sarah Emma Edmonds. And there were a lot of women that stepped up as spies. Again, talk about taking some very serious risks. Mary Jane, Mary Bowser, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, Mary Jane Richards, she goes by several names. This research, you have to be careful if you go look her up because there will be some, I've, I've, I read, read, read about this. There's a lot that say she was in, um, uh, she was in Jefferson, um, Rich, Richmond. She was actually in um, Confederate Davis's house and spying there. There's a lot of those kind of stories. But what they have found is that that is not entirely accurate. But this woman was very elusive. She was a, an enslaved woman who was freed, and she was part of her formerly, uh, former owner's daughter's slave ring. Uh, she had been taught to read. She had been taught to write. She had been sent to Liberia and then joined the spy ring. So she was very, very active with the Richmond Libby prison. Um, she was out doing a lot of things, but she knew where the Union troops were. She could sneak around and do things, but she really disappeared from history in about 1870. So she just kind of just disappeared. She is mentioned in the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame, though, which was the name that, ironically, she used the least, Mary Jane Bowser, and she was in, um, inducted in 1995. So fascinating woman. We don't know a lot about her, but we do know that she did exist, and she made a tremendous impact. Well, sometimes, just like this woman was there in Richmond to be able to spy on the troops and so forth and report back to the Union, women found themselves in the right place at the right time. Don't you love it when those kind of things happen and you're just there to help? So we have a next young woman by the name of Rebecca Wright. So if we're looking at where we are in the war, we are now kind of around 1864. Rebecca Wright's family, they lived in Winchester, Virginia. I just actually happened to have family there. And Winchester was a pivotal area in the war. There were three battles fought, first, second, and third battle of Winchester. It was a crossroads of what seemed like everything. It was a marketplace. It was a very fruitful part of the country. There were multiple roads and railroads. Everything was there. And so it was, it was what both sides desired. The North wanted it, and the South wanted it. If the North lost Winchester, that would mean potentially that Washington, D.C. could be threatened. Whereas if the South lost it, then Lee's flank, where he was at the time in Richmond, could be threatened. So Winchester was a very, very big area. So we have Major General Philip Sheridan, who was now in this area, and he needed to get some information about Jubal Early's army. What he found is that he needed a civilian confidant in Winchester to get him the information that he needed. And he didn't know who he should do. So he was talking with another general and found out um, about a young woman named Rebecca Wright, who was a Quaker school teacher. She had been uh, dining with the, the, these families and been found to be a very high moral character, a wonderful young lady. And her family was a union sympathizing family. They knew, though, that she was under constant surveillance. So they weren't sure of what to do. But Crook did tell Sheridan, I will stake my shoulder traps that this girl is loyal. So we are now at about September 15th, 1864. Sheridan wrote a note, General Sheridan wrote a note on a little square of tissue paper asking if she would serve it, serve him and give her some information. Rolled this up teeny tiny into a little piece of tin foil, put it into a capsule that would then be given to Thomas Laws. And Laws was an enslaved person who had kind of the ability to go back and forth to sell his vegetables. 
he had to carry it in his mouth as he was walking through. And if he was discovered, he was obviously ordered to swallow it. So Laws came to the door, and she welcomed him. And he, she was shocked when he says, OK, here's why I'm here. I learned from Major Crook that you are a loyal lady and still love the old flag. So General Sheridan had asked several questions about Jubal Early's forces. Could we, would you be willing to help us? She didn't really think. You know, She's just thinking, who am I to be able to do this? I don't really know enough. So she told Laws, I need some time to think about it. And he came back. She knew that her life would be on, line, her, on, on the line, her family's life would be on the line, because they, they were already known to be union sympathizers. So she takes this step. Is she willing to go all the way? What would her neighbors think? And her father, as you saw in the previous slide, had already died at Confederate prison because he was arrested in 1862 as a sympathizer. So she knew the Confederates were always watching their home. They had even searched their home before. But she decided she believed in the cause of the Union, and so she agreed to help uh, Sheridan. She had some information, so she passed that on. She thought, I never really thought this was anything valuable. But it turned out that it was. And so. The troops, Sheridan's troops, entered Winchester. There was a lot of fighting. She and her mom were downstairs. Finally, she heard, uh, heard the sounds of what sounded like victory. And she came up the stairs and saw the dear old flag is coming back again. All will be right again now. So Sheridan then came straight to her house. He was so uh, appreciative of her help. He praised her and even gave her a gift and telling her, you probably are not aware of the great service you rendered the Union caused by the information you sent me. But it was because this information that the battle was fought and probably won. So what did he give her? He gave her a gold watch, um, beautifully set with pearls. It was a wonderful gift. Well, Rebecca, sadly, this is more of the risk taking, right? She tried to keep her gift a secret. She tried to keep all of this a secret. But it was all around the town by this point. Uh, there was, her house was boycotted, uh, national headlines. Um, they just basically were drummed out of Winchester. So she then went on to reach out to Sheridan for some help um, and later get another job down the road. So again, looking at the impact, a reporter came back and asked Sheridan about the importance of uh, her contribution. And he said, that woman was worth a whole brigade of soldiers and several series of artillery down on the Winchester campaign. She was one of the genuine heroines of the war. So I don't think women are sitting on the sidelines much, right? They're out there actually contributing and doing. So we've seen that women are showing courage. They're showing that they have the ability to take risks and make sacrifices. They're obviously being creative how they're solving problems. They have to persevere. And persevering does not just include just for themselves, but is called stepping up for like women and for like causes. So we see now we have a lot of activism taking place. We see women stepping into roles for abolitionists and women's suffrage. The two go hand in hand. The three go hand in hand. Well, Harriet Tubman, anybody not hear of her? Sure everybody's heard of her. Well, what a lot of people don't know, besides being um, an enslaved woman who uh, ran away and the conductor of the Underground Railroad, is that they don't know that she was a, um, the first woman to lead an armed expedition in the war. She was a spy. She actually uh, raided, guided the raid at Combahee Ferry, liberating 700 slaves. So she was quite a force to be reckoned with in several areas. She didn't want to just fight for herself or for people like her. She wanted to continue to get out and persevere with all of these causes. Mary Livermore was another abolitionist and nurse. And she found that uh, there were one of the battles that Grant was in at Fort Donelson. And the, the casualties were just huge. And what she saw actually uh, caused her to nearly faint because it was such a, a harsh scene that she saw. So some of the doctors says, well, you know what, this is for you. See, we tried to tell you women should not be in there. But she said, again, Persevering, I forced myself to remain in the wars without nausea or faintness. Never again were my nerves distor disturbed by any sight or sound of the horror. So she knew this was important enough to her that she had to find a way to overcome her own challenges. 
Another crusading abolitionist, Mary Ann Shad Carey, had actually been born to a free black family in Delaware. And she uh, was dedicated to the abolitionist movement, participated in the Underground Railroad. She became the first African-American um, female newspaper editor in North American history. She came back and was recruiting soldiers for the United States Army. So she knew that, again, this was more than just her cause, but it was a cause that was important for everyone. So we see that you've probably heard me say that a lot of these women were the first, the first editor, the first woman to lead a, a, uh, a guided tour, the first woman to, um, for the war to go out and work on this. So women were automatically stepping up and being trailblazers. They were being pioneers. They were firsts. They had challenges. Again, they never set out to make history. They just set out to make a difference. And so often, the honor of being first fell to them. A couple firsts that are worth noting. Susie Baker, she's one of those I would wish I could go back in time and meet. She was never paid for her work. She was the first African-American Army nurse. Uh, she taught other soldiers how to read with the South Carolina volunteers. She had been an enslaved woman who, who, who ran away and who had made it, but was never um, she traveled with her husband, but she was never paid or never acknowledged for any of her work. But she was a significant trailblazer. Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, uh, we just heard a Mary Edwards Walker speaker this past weekend. She was the first woman to be given the Medal of Honor for her work. She was the first female surgeon that stepped up. She had countless stories of offering her service and was turned down, no, 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 and no. But she continued working even informally, and was not ever granted a commission, but she persevered. She was steadfast to the cause because she cared. So she was the first and the only woman from the Civil War to earn a Medal of Honor. Well, the very sad part of this story was that in 1917, all the conditions for how you earn a Medal of, of Honor were changed, so hers was taken away from her. After all that time of being told no, she was finally recognized with the Medal of Honor, and then it was yanked. Well, thankfully, President Jimmy Carter, anybody remember him? 1977, one of the great things he did do was he corrected this, and this Medal of Honor was returned to her family. So she was just one of the many, many women that we see who were trailblazers, who persevered because they, they had the tenacity. Harriet Jacobs is the last one that we'll, we'll talk about, another powerful, powerful woman. And she was the first woman to write her own fugitive story, her slave story. The book is called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, so if you're interested in that type of, of reading. She was abused, um, sexually uh, beaten by her master, and she hid for seven years in a crawl space in her grandmother's um, storeroom. How she did not lose her, her sanity, how she was able to still kind of care for her children, seven years is a really long time. She had been finally freed, and then she went out to write her story. Now, one last area that we don't often think about, and she's our last with our first, is chaplains. Chaplains were becoming increasingly important and valuable. Think about the morale. Think about the need for faith and hope at the time of this, our nation's bloodiest conflict. And so chaplains were becoming more and more important. Uh, their influence was long lasting. There was a um, Virginia infantry private who said there's a protracted meeting going on in camp. We have preaching in the noon and preaching in the evening. And it is my opinion that it will do us a good deal of good. So they needed chaplains. Well. Ellen Hobart was an ordained minister, and she had gotten the endorsement from several people, including the governor, even President Lincoln supported her to become the chaplain of the 1st Wisconsin Regiment of Heavy Artillery. She was the first female chaplain in the United States military. Well, unfortunately, there's always got to be somebody in your way, right? Secretary of War Edwin Stanton said, you know what? We don't want to set this precedent by letting women into these roles. So I refuse this petition. You may not do this. Well, now the Wisconsin governor, who had originally supported her, he's like, oh, well, Stanton 
does not believe she's fit for this, so I refuse to commission her as well. If Stanton won't muster you, then I refuse to support you. So her status throughout the war was kind of just in limbo. And finally, in 1869, Congress said that they would pay and recognize her as a chaplain. But it was still not the commission. So she did all this work. They says, yeah, okay, well, you're here. But she really did not get commissioned until 2002, President George W. Bush posthumously appointed her to the grade of captain. So talk about stories of perseverance and people who said, I will continue doing this for however long I have to. So as we've seen, we've seen some, just these characteristics of these women of the Civil War are just, are, they're thread throughout their story. The one thing I think that really jumps out at me is even after the war's done and over with, they did not stop. They did not necessarily go back to their roles, like I joked earlier, of darning socks and just caring for children. They were truly dedicated to the cause that they'd already started. Claire Barton, we all talked about her as the angel of the battlefield, but what we don't, a lot of us don't remember is that she was very concerned about the missing. There were no organized uh, systems or organizations at that time that would track people. And if someone says, well, where's my loved one? Where's my father or my husband? So she made history by stepping out and getting information organized. She had President Lincoln's support. He said, to the friends of missing persons, Miss Clara Barton has kindly offered to search for the missing prisoners of war. Please address her at Annapolis, giving her the name, regiment, and company of any missing prisoner. That was dated March 11th, 1865. And if you know your history, it wasn't long after that President Lincoln uh, lost his life. But she was appointed to the head of the missing soldier's office, and she went on then to help locate the unmarked graves of approximately 13,000 Union soldiers. So quite, quite a tireless woman who, who wanted to do everything she could. We talked about Harriet Patience Dame. That's her later, after she's obviously cleaned up and had aged a bit. Uh, she was awarded by the New Hampshire legislature $500. This is around that time, which is a lot of money, for her service as a thank you. But she says, you know what? We need to build a home for the veterans. And so the majority of her money went there. She was the, uh, had the honor of being the first portrait of a woman to be able to hang, actually hang in their New Hampshire legislature. And it was commissioned after, right after she died. So what is our challenge for today? We're about ready to wrap it up. So any football fans here? Couple of football fans. It's going to be football season soon, right? Even though it doesn't seem like it outside. I'll take you back a couple years ago. Uh, we here in the Miami Valley had a lot to be proud of. It was a Super Bowl. Don't ask me which one because I forgot exactly which one it was. But that year, at the opening of the game's festivities, there was the stealth bomber, the famous flyover, flew right over top of the, um, the game. And that year, the bomber was piloted by a University of Dayton graduate, Air Force Captain Sarah Koshuba. I remember watching that that day and all of the laud and attention and stories that had been given to this young woman. As I thought about all those people who were there and when they looked up, if they could think back, and if we could think back to those early Civil War women and the Revolutionary women before them, would they have ever looked to the skies and thought that they would have such a position of honor? Would they have ever thought that their efforts would have made such a lasting impact and how far they would go? So it was a very long journey for women. It was a very exhausting journey. Their roles changed through the years. They still had a lot of the same setbacks. In fact, my book, uh, Empowered Women, which kind of highlights stories of Ohio women, it has, it has a, some of the Civil War information in it, um, one chapter. But what I found as I read this, as I wrote this book and did all of my research, and it goes all the way through modern day, is that the same types of challenges came for these women. Every generation, every war, every conflict. So even though you think, really, did we not just prove ourselves in nursing? And we got to prove ourselves again. Did we not show you what we could do? And they had to do it again. Such a powerful, powerful story of empowerment and of hope and of what people can do when they really care to make a difference. So I think our challenge today 
when we look at the question of Civil War women and their impact is not so much, well, why? Why did it take so long for them to be recognized? Or why did it take so long and we needed George Bush or Jimmy Carter to come out and actually do what should have been done a long time ago? I think the, the most important thing is that we remember and that we honor these women and we remember their stories and we continue telling their stories because this is part of our history as Americans. This is part of our history for women who served in the military. When we pause to remember their stories, we see a more complete story of the Civil War. I'll end with a quote. Having the honor of the acquaintance with one of those heroines, a woman now earning her bread in the treasury, but during the war performed an art which entitles her to the homage of every loyal heart, I want to tell her story to the world. It may have been familiar to some long years ago, but we are so busy remembering the evil things that are done that the brave deeds are forgotten unless their story is often repeated. This was a writer in 1883 in the Detroit Post and Tribune. How true is that today, right? We have so much negativity that can be out in the world, but instead of focusing on that, and we look back and see these positive, positive stories of people of Civil War women who made a difference, I believe that's what can touch all of our lives. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim. Do any of you have any questions for Kim? Well, John, yes, Vicki. Can you Yeah, uh, Amanda Stokes. I'm going to send you information on Amanda Stokes. Thank you. It does. It really She's does. She's Ohioan? Ah, well, there we go. Yes. <laughs> Got to get her. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Yes. Did they all earn, like, the afterwards? Oh, they had to fight for them, yes. Um, in fact, that's what a lot of the women did in that ongoing dedication, that they stepped up. They wanted to help other women to be able to get their pensions. Some were given, some were not. And what, where you lot, found a lot of the challenge was the, the women that served as men. Because since there was no official record, well, how do I know that that was you? So they would say, well, this is my name. So they did fight. And a lot of them were able to get it, but a lot did not. Some never stepped forward to claim their pensions. They just did their time. They served. And they went back to their lives knowing what they had done. I mean, to me, that, that's quite a sacrifice even at that point, to not want that recognition. It's pretty amazing. Yes. Yes, yeah, she was born free in Delaware. Yes, yeah, sorry if I was confusing on that. Yep, you're right. Well, thanks again. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. So, like I said, um, if you're interested in reading these are books, uh, they can be read, obviously, as an adult. They can be given to um, high school, eh, maybe junior high, I say high school. Right now, we're very pleased that um, I'm very pleased that this book is going to be put into a University of Dayton leadership class coming up this fall. This is my newest book, Link in the Servant Leader. So if you have any interest or passion for servant leadership and what how we can encourage, just like Lincoln did, to step out beyond ourselves and to serve, kind of like the stories of the women, but this one is more focusing on Lincoln and his leadership, how he listened, how he was able to work with people that he disagreed with, uh, what his vision was for the country, and how he persevered through all of that. So these books are $12 each. I'll be happy if you're interested. Um, but I want to thank you again for your attention, and it was such an honor and a, uh, just a privilege to be here. So thank you very much. Vicki will be selling her books over there. Please remember that uh, the museum is open. The great art display is going on, deja vu uh, for two. Uh, and also the gift shop has a 10% discount. See you all next month. Take care. <laughs>